Welcome to Unlearn, where we talk to industry leaders about unlearning how we go to market. I'm Kelly Sarabin, and I run tech partner enablement and advocacy at HubSpot. And I'm Asher Matthew, co-founder of Partnership Leaders. The old ways of going to market are getting more expensive and less effective. To thrive in an era of digital transformation, you have to go to market differently. Let's find out how. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Unlearn podcast. Uh, we have Kelly, the amazing Kelly, and uh, and we have Hong from uh, Oracle joining us today. And uh, I'm your host, Asher, and we're kicking off a new season. Uh, but first of all, Happy New Year to you, Kelly. Thank you. Excited. It's already February, though. We're, we're a little late in the game, but it's all that planning you have to do with our company. So hopefully everybody's Q1 is going well. Hong, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And speaking of celebrating New Year, I got the privilege of celebrating three New Year's in a year. Yeah, right? <laughs> This January, the U.S. New Year's, and then yep. there's the Chinese New Year that's actually coming up tomorrow. Um, oh, it's tomorrow? Okay, great. Chinese New Year. Uh, Gong Hei. Gong Hei And uh, Cambodian New Year's in April. <laughs> oh, man. All different calendars. <laughs> you have a lot of New Year's resolutions, I'm sensing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do resolutions. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a futile effort. <laughs> well, to me, if you miss one milestone, you just restart. You know, it sounds like you you you, you have a higher uh, success or chance, chance of success rate. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you only had to make it a month for the first New Year's resolution. Yeah. <laughs> man- that's more manageable. Asher already gave up on his New Year's resolution, which was I, to I, be I did, nicer. I did because, like, because <laughs> like everybody else, I said, you know what, the year's going to kick off. It's going to be an amazing year. We've gone through all the trimming and all the other things that we needed to do last year, uh, but apparently not. You know, so the the chaos is still uh, still going on and. Uh, um, and then, and and then we just have to figure it out, I guess, uh, just like we did last year. Mm, well, well, good. New year, new start. Um, cool, cool. Hawk, so tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, before we kick this this show off. Yeah, sure. Um, so Hong Chun here. I've been in the tech industry for <clears throat> the, too long that I care to admit. Um, but I, um, uh, let's say, twenty five plus years. Um, and uh, no, I I feel very blessed to be able to do what I do because um, I um, I cut my I, I cut my teeth writing code uh, way back then when there was a I had to write a assembly code. Um, wow. My proudest moment is my device driver is only one K in size, one K, <laughs> um, and it does encryption even for the, before the CPU could uh, was powerful enough to do uh, software encryption and decryption. Um, but it's a it's it's an awesome journey. Um, it's a, I, I like to say that uh, right now I work for Oracle Corporation. I lead up the global strategic partnership. Basically, my job is to identify and uh, key technology uh, partners and ISVs uh, so that we can do global partnerships. Oracle is going through a huge transition in terms of. Um, our product portfolio. We have a world class cloud platform. Uh, we're moving our business into a subscription model. Uh, the old days of just string grab software running on prem, um, while it's good business, it's, that's not where the future is. And so because of that, Oracle needs to change the way, uh, Oracle, uh, do partnership with our tech partners, uh, ISV as well as a SI. Uh, both the global SI and the regional SI. And so that's why I, I'm, I'm super excited to uh, do what I do today, joining Oracle, because I have an opportunity uh, to help Oracle transform in the process uh, and then um, help deliver innovative solutions to our joint customers um, uh, together. Um, so I, prior to Oracle, I, I was at uh, Alibaba Cloud uh, for about three and a half, four years, um, pretty much doing the same thing where I start up and lead the global uh, strategic partnership, both uh, ISV and GSI, um, and helping Alibaba cloud grow uh, globally. Uh, and prior to that, I spent about 13 years at Microsoft in multiple leadership roles, um, culminating in the last seven out of that 13, uh, working very closely with uh, Microsoft's uh, partner ecosystem, especially the ISV and uh, GSI. Um, so 
that's that's sort of like a quick fast forward in terms of my career. But I'd love to uh, spend some time today and we just share with you like sort of my journey and why I do what I do and why it gets me up in the morning every day. Yeah. 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 So I mean, so let's kick this conversation off with uh, the <clears throat> the top things I learned this week, right? So. So I was at uh, ImpartnerCon, which is, a, and Impartner is one of the partner tech vendors, uh, and uh, and they they had a number of uh, senior leaders from uh, from the space there. But what you know, what the, the interesting thing that I found is if we split partnerships into, let's say, production, distribution, and consumption, right, uh, and use that framework, uh, most of the folks over there were in the distribution bucket. And uh, and and then uh, and then I had to explain to them why producing product together with companies is important, and then uh, and then you have to focus on the consumption uh, stage of it uh, of, of it as well. Um, and it just felt like like it was news to them, and also mm-hmm. they have to rethink about their role in this new world where owning the workflow. And uh, uh, and and producing technologies uh, together with other companies um, matters a lot. And then uh, and then I shared with them this stat uh, around just the layoffs that happened. And you know, like wave one of layoffs, I think was a little bit more on the go-to-market side, but the wave two of layoffs was definitely hit software engineers too. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then we did this stat, uh, this research that showed in the last uh, twelve or so months, uh, a number of engineers uh, 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 were laid off which actually slows down innovation and uh, and the need for partner teams to now evolve and go work with ISVs and SIs is actually even more important than just the distribution piece because once you have the products built, the, the distribution co- automatically comes uh, comes next. And so, so it was very interesting to share this information with like what happened during the layoffs and like why co-building with others is important. Uh, but there is a large, large, large number of let's call it partner leaders that have been focused on only the distribution piece, um, and uh, and it was it was new learning for them. And uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up this topic because I live that every day here in what I do, not just at Oracle but at Alibaba Cloud and at Microsoft as well. Because the point about if you're focused on the distribution aspect of it, distribution and resale, that implies that you got stuff to, to already distribute, yep. right? Uh, you got products and stuff that you're already dis- willing to work with others to distribute. But in this day and age, the technology and landscape changes so much. The business model changes so much. The yep. competitors yep. changes so much that uh, you got to constantly go through this uh, innovation cycle. <clears throat> and you cannot innovate all by yourself. Yep. Right? And so this is where the partnership become super important because you're talking about faster time to market. If you're going to do everything yourself in-house, the D- DIY approach, yep. it's going to take you forever. And by that time, your competitor will be leapfrog you already. I live yep. that every day right now as I go through, think through what my job is uh, yeah. at, at, at Oracle. Um, and so just to put a, a pin on and an example of that, right? When I make decisions on like, oh crap, if, if I'm working with a various different Oracle products, we need to innovate. So let's take AI right now, AI category as an example. Yep. Yeah, Oracle has the chops. We can go hire a bunch of data scientists. We can have a bunch of engineers and we can go build our own large language model, fine tune it, train it and all that stuff. Um, probably going to take us a couple of years to do that. And by the time we get it done, we need to rinse and repeat and we do that again. Uh, and so it's an ongoing investment. Um, time is not on our side. Um, so this is the value of partnership. This is where we, we, we partner so that we have the co-innovate together, where we get the best of both worlds. We we announced that Cohere partnership. Um, that aligns really well. Uh, you, you hear Greg Pavlik on 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 the Oracle side talking about our AI strategy in, in four pillars. Um, <clears throat> but in order for us to execute on that four pillar strategy, um, uh, we're investing a lot in the infrastructure and the chip, um, in the pass layer. We have the app layer. Um, and then we, we need to, we, we need to build a world class robust, um, uh, AI, um, model. And this is, that's where we, we, we partner. That allows us to get to market a lot quicker. You see that's being done at Microsoft as well with OER. 
OpenAI, uh, Google is doing the same thing with partners. This is a new it, this is a new way of looking at partnership. It's that co-innovation piece. And then once you have all that stuff, I mean, the distribution and the reseller, they can still do what they do, but we need to put more Apple in the Apple cart so that they can go sell more apples. <laughs> totally. And, 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 and speaking <laughs> of Apple, by the way, you know, I also gave this example because I had I had a meeting with their team, and and to me, even at that scale, the biggest opportunity is for the Apple Consultants Network to work with the App Store uh, uh, partners, and and there there is a world where those two two sides of the let's call it their business comes together, um, mm-hmm. and and you know like as, and and then as I was having conversations with people in Miami. The, the value of partnerships came up right and uh, and and it's 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 just like any other function right you have to like keep talking about the value that you produce and mm-hmm. and and what was interesting was that if our partner leaders now take the approach of tying everything back to shareholder returns because the shareholders are not pausing for their returns right they're very uh, I would say uh, greedy people, you know, it's okay to say that, you know, and, uh, 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 and, and partnerships definitely like from the, from what you just said, Hong, like allows you to create innovation and then you can utilize distribution on top of that and work on consumption. And then you'll get to the shareholder returns. And that's how I believe the modern partnership leader should be, be sharing information about how, um, um, how they can increase their impact inside of organizations. Yeah. And it's also, we need to take a long-term view as well, right? Because, you know, a lot, I work for a public company, just like anyone else, but oftentimes we have a tendency of making, uh, trying to manage through the quarter. But when it comes to partnership, I, and I, this is, it, this is a marriage. When you, when you have a partnership with, uh, with another company, you want that partnership to last long-term and you can't take shortcut to a long-term uh, relationship, right? You, you, you got to make sure you have synergy and alignment in terms of the, um, the, what each companies are looking to get out of that partnership. Um, you got to make sure that there's a mutual respect and interest, senior leverage, uh, senior leadership buy-in on a long-term partnership. Because when you, when you focus on that long-term partnership, you do it for, you do the right thing for that innovation that I was talking about. So that the customer would care. Uh, so because at the end of the day, you want, you're doing this to better serve and better drive customer success. It's just that now we're doing it together with our partners instead of doing it by ourselves. Um, so think, think long term. And to be honest with you, a lot of this innovation thing that I was talking about, you can't just do that in one quarter. Uh, you can't realize the <laughs> result in one quarter. It, it takes time um, to build something that will last. Um, just, just for example, uh, when I was at, uh, Ali, there's, because of the changing landscape of the business needs, um, there are regulatory compliance, um, pressure, there are, there are data sovereignty rule, there are, uh, a bunch of regulation and every country is coming out with their own, um, data privacy and data sovereignty regulations. And that necessitated the different ways of running, of, of delivering solutions to customers. Like stuff needs to run inside the country physically, right? Uh, so, and with the, when, with the, when the customers moving to the cloud, it requires a different way of partnering. Why? For example, take Salesforce. Salesforce is investing traditionally in the past. They run their own data center. They, they have a world class. Uh, SaaS solutions, they run their own data center. But as they expand into other countries, they might not have footprint in that country. But now when you add on top of that, the data sovereignty rule, the, the, the various different uh, government uh, regulations, there's no way for them to deliver that unless they invest multi-billion dollar physical infrastructure and data center to do that. But even if they do that, it doesn't allow them to be in complying with the local government regulation because you need a local company inside that country that has all the necessary certification to deliver that solution. And if you're a US-based company, you can't do that in Saudi Arabia or in mainland China, for example, right? And so this is driving a new way to do partnership. So uh, I use the sales for example, because 
it's um they need to run it across these solutions across multi-cloud instead of building their own data center. And that requires re-architecting of their flagship solution, the foundational piece. New engineering required new investment. But the cool thing about that is that once they do it once, they can run it in all the other clouds um, very quickly. That allows them to go into all the countries to serve the mutual business needs and partner with the local um, uh, tech companies in whatever various different country and region that they're in. This is the value of partnership because they cannot do it alone. Um, and and um, I see this trend um, happening over and over. The larger, you, the, the more global you are, the more you need to do this. And you, you gotta really, traditional enemies become friends because mutual customers want us to become friends and we have to do it. Otherwise, uh, we might uh, become irrelevant in that particular market. Super interesting. I think um, that's a great example of kind of strategic co-building and same thing with like the Microsoft and the open AI, very strategic. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts on kind of scaling these co-building relationships? Like you mentioned ISVs, right? A lot of platforms have a, a large number of ISVs around them. Um, and there needs to be a co-building direction to service the customer, right? So you can't have um, a CRM building off in one direction in certain features and the ISVs around them are building others. New APIs come out. Mm -hmm. Have you got thoughts to how you do that a more scaled level, right? Because you're not going to have a strategic, super close relationship with all those ISVs, but you still need to think of it from a co-building framework of yes. how do we build together in service of the customer. So is that something you think about or is that something in your purview? Yeah. All, all the time, right? Because when we build these, um, what I call the <clears throat> very deep partnership, uh, especially, the, especially take, take for example, Microsoft, for example. Microsoft's got a robust partner ecosystem. Um, uh, you guys uh, heard uh, we announced a deal with Microsoft uh, several months ago where the first time in history in 45 years where you got Larry. Uh, oh, that was Satya very interesting. Aaron, sitting in the very same much room. Seattle, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that picture uh, could, could be in a museum some museum someday when we look back and say, yes, that, that happened. Uh, it takes 45 years, but it happened. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, it's a great partnership because you got two world-class platforms coming together while we compete in other areas, but we can still find ways to work together when it comes to the multi-cloud, cloud talking to cloud. Um, why? So Kelly, getting back to your question around the, the ISV partner ecosystem, Oracle's got our own partner ecosystem. Microsoft's got their own partner ecosystem. When the two platform works together, we just inherited each other's ecosystem, <laughs> right? We make it easier for the partners that already work on uh, Azure to be able to do what they do on Azure. Uh, sorry for this. Someone gets called. Um, and and the, the, the services, uh, the application that's sitting on Azure can be a, can talk to database on, a, on, a, on the Oracle side and vice versa, right? So now it's less lift for customers to be able to take advantage of the best of both worlds just by connecting the two platforms together. Um, and, and it's, and it's, um, this, this is a, a good pattern, right? When, when, when you talk about partnership, people keep saying that it's one plus one equals three. This is how you get to the one plus one equals three. Cause you don't, you don't have to re, re, repeat every single thing that your partner is doing. And, and the other thing is, um, it's not just inheriting the ecosystem, but it's also building trust. There's trust on, uh, on your partner already that's willing to, that the ISV is already willing to invest their engineering resource and solutions on that platform A. And if platform A connects with platform B, a whole ecosystem platform B now can take advantage of platform A. So, and, and it's, it's a best way to, to build trust is through association with someone who's already, um, where the customer already trust them. <laughs> Oh, I think it's a great point. And, and also in the customer facing, right? Like if you have that relationship, then you can sort of validate to your customer that you put credence in that relationship and it doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. 
Mm-hmm. So it just sort of expands the kind of circle of trust that your own platform is is bringing in to customers and partners. Yeah, and and that's why I made the point that uh, these kind of key partnership is like a marriage. So that's why you need to think long term. It can't just be a partnership for one year. Otherwise, how committed are you to that partnership? It was just so short, right? Yeah, it should be. <laughs> and 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 customers want that, right? If I'm a large enterprise customer using this solution. I don't want it to go away after one year. Then what happened? Why, why am I betting my business critical systems on the solution when I don't have the confidence that the the vendor is going to be supporting me long term? So that's 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 the the, the, the long term view is critical for this. So that brings up a really good point, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think it ties into trust, right? You mentioned that competitors become friends, right, at demand of. Com- of the customer. And this is more and more common. I think whether you're a point solution, a platform enterprise, no matter what size partner, your GSI, Mm -hmm. how do, do you have advice for navigating the competitive cooperation line where you have business entities that you are trying to build trust and have a partnership, but the reality is other parts of your business are directly competing for deals and the people within your organization that are having to compete may be putting pressure in the opposite direction, right? When you get in large companies, you have multiple different entities within the company. Any advice on that topic? Because I think that's only going to accelerate where we have more relationships, that we have friendships and competitions within one relationship. What are some of the practices for navigating that successfully? Yeah, I think it's, it has to start with shared interest um, and, and shared roadmap. and the shared interest is super important. The shared roadmap doesn't have to be shared roadmap across the entire portfolio of the two companies, right? It could just be one particular area where we share the roadmap and, and where um, we decide that, hey, it's for the best interest of our customers. We, just, we, we, we should work better together instead of work against each other. And we can still compete in other areas as well. Now that's That's... That's free market, right? Um, we, we can compete and we can work together. At the end of the day, why are we doing this? We're doing this so that we can better serve our customers because they're the one that's paying the bill, right? If we keep fighting and we don't go serve our customers, what's the purpose of fighting? They're, they're not going to buy your stuff anyway, right? Um, and so you got to have like sh- um, senior level uh, shared interest to do this. And of course, once you do this, when you get down to the lower level in the field of up to sales, execu- execution, things like that, those are the part of the growing pain when, 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 when competing entities come together and, and try to carve out a swim lane where we work together and the swim lane where we don't work together. Uh, it, it's just, it's part of cultural change as well that needs to go from, go from top down, right? Especially making sure that when you have that shared interest, anything that's related to that new innovative solution we got to remove friction from a sales execution perspective, like sales incentives, comps, uh, operations, uh, joint messaging, things like that, so that this, it, we don't create confusion uh, among the customer. Like, are you fighting or, or should be working with both of you, both of you for, the, uh, for this joint solution? So it's, um, my personal experience is that top-down approach is critical. And then from the, from the bottom up, that um, cleaning up the, the operational details, the sales incentive, those kinds of things has to come as well to smooth out any potential conflict in, um, in go-to-market and, and how we position it to customers. Um, it's, it's a learning process, but it's got to come from the top down. Yeah, I, think, I, so I want to pivot the conversation a little bit to how does a partner leader uh, prepare themselves for the scale at which you operate, Hong, because I think <clears throat> we're going to have an influx of next gen partner leaders who are actually coming up from the production side versus just the distribution side. But they need to think about scale the way you think about scale, right? And given your experience at operating at, at large scale, I'd, I'd, I'd wonder. If you can share a little bit of like the journey that you went through to prepare yourself to operate at a scale like that, and then how do you all how do you push yourself to always stay at that level 
because it's very, I want to say, tempting to go do these like little projects that will give you maybe like five, 10 million bucks of like revenue. But where you're up coming from, you need like what way more than that. Um, yeah, I think the, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Let me just um, start off by just talking a little bit with my journey and then I'll, I'll come around into yeah, totally. um, how I think about what is a scalable um, partnership, uh, at least from my point of view, right? I wake up every day. Uh, in my, uh, I, I said I've been in this business for 25 plus years and I cut my teeth writing code and then uh, throughout my career, I own my own consulting companies, startups, working with different industry like Merck Pharmaceutical. It get, gets me exposure into um, global operations as well as in the healthcare industry and life sciences, working in tech like Microsoft and, and Alibaba. That journey, gives me that world perspective because it's um it's very tempting if you're just working within one country every uh, all, you have your silo uh, thinking in just what works in one country you think it might work on another country no <laughs> um you gotta it, it helps to have the mm -hmm. global perspective as well uh, so that there is um room for optimization regionally but also have some global um, consistency uh, when, when, when you do this kind of global partnership. And the, the partnership that often give you the best bang for your buck are the, what I call <clears throat> platform related partnership. Um, what do I mean by platform? Like multi-cloud, um, cloud to cloud partnership is an example of that. Um, the Salesforce example, that I was talking about is another another example of that because that is a platform that they're going to be running on a hyperscaler environment and pick your favorite country. But it, it um, back to your question. Think about a global consistency in terms of solutions offering, but also be open to each region's um, needs. Uh, for example, Salesforce offer their Salesforce platform in mainland China, but there's a there's a mainland China flavor in terms of features, products, and functionality that is super critical in that market that might not be critical for a market in in um, EMEA or North America. For example, in China, it's everything's done through e wallet, everything's done through mobile phone. So the stuff that you're offering need to be conducive to how they live their life in terms of driving and interfacing with your product through that phone. Um, how they pay for things is all, they're so advanced. They, they, they've done almost everything, including the vendor in the corner will accept a QR code and accept an e-payment, uh, no cash. So you got to optimize your products and solutions for that. Um, so, so have that worldwide perspective allows you to craft a deal that um, allows for global consistency, but also leave room for regional optimization uh, as well. Um, and if you do this well, um, it it allows autonomy for for exponential growth um, because not every single market um, you can take the same tactic to, uh, to drive growth um, and. And that you, you need to make sure that your product that you're offering meets all those regional um, uh, product demands uh, in whatever country there is. Regular compliance is another one. Data sovereignty, features and functionality, um, and and let them loose. And 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 when when I said this platform partnership, they come with their own um ecosystem as well back to kelly's point about inheriting the isv or the existing partnership there are partnerships um in in the salesforce salesforce example uh where they have partners in in that country that customers already trust right so now you're able to optimize that relationship in that country um Without changing anything uh, unnecessarily, if it doesn't, it's not broken. Don't change it, and they already built the trust. Leverage that trust through your partners. Yeah, and and I guess uh, 
uh, to dive double click on this a little bit, right? So like, like <clears throat> I feel like there's a pyramid of like partner leaders, right? And then there's some partner leaders that can think up to the scale of like, let's call it like $10 million partnerships, right? And then there's some people that can think of like $500 million partnerships, right? And then there's some people that can think and work on $5 billion uh, type of partnerships, right? And so what does it take to be at that scale? The, the, um, I think you alluded to maybe about 20 minutes ago where when you when you're dealing with those type of large global partnership, it's not there are multiple dimensions that you have to think through. Um, the innovation and the solution that you're building together is only one component of that. Yeah. So as as a as a global partner leader like like my boss, right? He he thinks through what are the programs, partner programs, um, needs to be put in place to incentivize the partnership for growth. And these partner programs could be <clears throat> could be partner incentives. Yep. It would include sales incentives as well uh, yep. from both companies. Because if the sales team are not aligned, if they're fighting each other, no matter how good your solutions is. Uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> you're, you're not going to be able to drive adoption, right? So you can't. So you, so so you think about the the solution that you're selling that you're building together. You work so hard to build this thing. You think about the operational, the sales side. What is what partner program to incentivize the partner to continue to ensure that the solution that we just worked so hard to build thrive, and it has to align to what's in it for the partner and what's in it for you as the uh, the, the company that's doing a partnership. So it's gonna have the shared interest. When I talk about shared mission and shared interest. It's got to have built-in uh, motivation up and down the up and down the the respective organization. Uh, so I talk about partner programs. I talk about the, and in some cases we also need to think about optimizing. If you're a global company, optimizing the the global resource as well as the regional resource in support of that partnership, right? Um, and these partner and these resource doesn't have to be sales resource. Yep. Right? It, it, it could be like a partner enablement or a part, or a PAM, a regional PAM and a global PAM, right? Um, because we, at the scale that we're talking about, you need someone to continue to make sure that you nurture that partnership and have that day to day hand combat <laughs> uh, in each of the region, working closely with the sales team and the partner management team, make sure they 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 uh, work well together, and if there's any conflict or escalation, they have a conduit to go back to the global team to make sure that hey, if this problem exists in 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 the UK, is it a consistent problem that exists in Russia in some other country as well? If so, let's fix it globally and then roll that out as well. But if it's not, but if it's something that's just particular to one country, empower that local country to. Uh, uh, optimize it over there and, and not mess around with the other country. So you need to think multiple multiple dimension. It sounds like one thing you're pointing out, which I I would agree with, is the partnership leader really needs to have a mind for systems at scale to see the bigger picture, right? Because the amount of internal, external stakeholders, the programs, incentives that have to come into play, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. And then you put that global, it's it's a lot. So I think someone who's successful at that level is going to have to mind to understand it so that the people beneath them, they can validate and lead and kind of understand that. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's an impressive skill. It's a multiple <laughs> knots that you need to tweak. And, and it's not just about the solution only. Um, I, I always akin to that. Like you gotta have, you can have the best sports car in the world, but if you don't have, um, the proper incentive for for the for your distributor and your your salespeople to go sell this thing properly, um, it's it's you're not going to get the 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 scale the global scale that you need, um, and, that, and that's why it's important you align all the different labs that I was talking about, like the sales operations, the incentives, um, and you know salespeople are coin operated, right? So you got to make sure, <laughs> you got to make sure that. <laughs> your world class solution that you work so hard to build with your partners 
yep. that they you incentivize them the right way to drive them to the behavior, the right behavior. I'm talking about that that um, to to drive adoption of this new solution. And if you don't have that, they just gonna they're not gonna care. So. Yeah, no, it's well said. And to, I mean, to, to give people an idea of the complexity of the world we live in, like this year, I believe fifty countries are having elections. You know, and so, so, so you have to kind of take a look at the macroeconomic uh, winds of change uh, mm-hmm. around the world, depending on the 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 areas that you're going to operate in, and and it's specifically like this this theme come, keeps coming up because now we have chief partner officers as a role that's coming up, and it's a trend that uh, uh, enterprise companies have signaled to the market normally. Roles like this come up through SMB for people are trying to, you know, uh, show that they're serious about uh, about the function. But this is actually more of an enterprise trend than anything than anything else. Uh, the latest one being Stripe, who's appointed one, and uh, and 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 to operate in that type of environment, you really need to, like you said, on uh, have a very global perspective. But then the the uh, it's it's a global uh, perspective, but with with uh, uh, with with keeping an eye, eye on like the areas that you really care about, right? Because like like operating in every single country out there won't actually doesn't really make sense for all companies, right? You need to pick the ones that really matter, and uh, and then to your point, attach the workflows of customers and then build around that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, well, well said. I'm glad you bring this point up because uh, I don't want to. I think it this way: you want to build a global scaffolding so that you can execute globally. But that doesn't mean that you're gonna to have to execute globally all at once, right? You, you gotta pick your pick your priority country, priority market, go where the demands are, but think globally in terms of that. So, so that scaffolding, and then you might you might check off a couple of those scaffolding um, in the process. So let's say you you, you have a global partnership with um, a, a great partner, um, even a Microsoft one that we we have, right? Even though we have global data center in pretty much across the entire world, when we launch this thing, we prioritize in which region um, that we want to go to market together first. And we pick the first 12 regions. Why? Because we did a due diligence and we figure out that, hey, this is a best bang for the buck if we go to this 12 region first because we are major customers asking for it in those regions. When we get that done, we can go tackle the next six or eight or 10 region as well. Um, partnership also is the best way to build a long sustainable marriage in a partnership is to show incremental wins together. Um, and best way to get more investment on a partnership is show that incremental win with real life customers singing your praises and tunes <laughs> on how good, how, how much they love it. Um, and then more investment will come. I think a related question to scale and also something that is top of mind, I think in a lot of ecosystems right now is multi-partner relationships. So is that something, and you said that you have kind of GSIs and ISVs under your purview, but um, so often, right, customers have experiences with multi-partners at once. And I think there's a increased interest in how do platforms, how do companies take a hand in orchestrating across multiple partners um, for various engagements, both long and short term? Like AWS is like enabling channel partners to package up ISVs, list them on their marketplace. Um, that's one way a company might facilitate those kind of multi-partner relationships. Is that something that you've given some thought to? Yeah, super important. Um, the Different types of partners plays a different role in this in this whole uh, ecosystem, right? I, I talk, I think about partner ecosystem, and in that partner ecosystem, the the reseller channel, the distributors, um, the SI, uh, and the ISV all play a major role. But how we go to market, we we do that differently. So in the case of a hyperscale cloud platform, we also have marketplace, right? So, so marketplace will be a good go-to-market avenue in terms of listing partners, ISVs, partner solutions on that marketplace. Make it make it easier for customer to adopt and transact. Um, the the SI plays a major role as well because the bigger the the more business critical the solution is, and and the more complex that solution that needs to be deployed globally by our customers, we're gonna we're gonna need 
the SI, especially like the global SI and even the regional SI, um, to be that last mile <laughs> uh, partner. I, I think of that as like in that scenario, it's that three legged stool where you get the you got the 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 tech and ISV partner uh, that's partnering um, used in this example like Oracle. We're building this new innovative solution. We create this extra apple that that we put into the apple cart so that our sellers can go sell. But our SI plays a critical critical role in selling that solution as well. Not only selling it, but incorporating it as part of the um, digital transformation work that they're doing with the customer and also hand-holding the customers um, in the implementation. Uh, and su- and ongoing support as well. Um, so super important. Um, that, that's why the the three legged stool is super important. And my job is to give our SI partner more ammunition and more goodies for them to go better satisfy his customers' needs. Makes sense. So um, any. Uh... This and you don't have, if if this is too forward a question you can let us know right but like any tips from like when partnerships have gone wrong uh, from your twenty five plus years Hong? Uh... Yeah, it's um. Well, first of all, there's a. I guess the 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 there's a good way and bad way, but the the thing is, things are changing so fast. Um. Over the uh, in this industry, um, but some, there's a couple of things that are consistent, right? If you don't have the shared mission and a shared interest between two two parties coming together, that that marriage is going to fail from the beginning. Right? And so you got to make sure when I talk about have that shared mission from the top down, CEO down. That's super important. Um, if if you don't have that, think twice uh, before uh, before you invest time and effort uh, doing that. Um, and building trust. Um, you might have that shared interest, but um, execution is key as well. So make sure you <clears throat> build trust between the partners that you that you work so hard to, um, to do because people come and go. Um, and so you got to have certain fundamental principle that the two companies need to work toward, right? That is driving customer success, building joint innovative solutions together, driving business impact. Um, if we all agree that those are the key pillars that um, we will continue to do together, regardless of who's which individual in that role is, they might come and go, but at least you have some sort of framework in terms of here's the here's the recipe to success for the partnership. Those three things, then then at least you have some guiding principle um, to ensure that the partnership lasts. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's all those three things that I talked about is really about what can we do better together to ensure that our customer are happy with us. <laughs> yeah, and and it's it's a great point you made because like the. The, the values of the organizations and just the, the, the role that culture plays in, in supporting your ecosystem, I think it's actually really important. Outside of just the mapping the TAM and mapping the ICP and all these things, I think they're they're great too, but a little bit more mechanical and a little bit more down the road. But the the some of the decisions are made around culture. And so just knowing the values of your company and mapping them, I think is actually, mm-hmm. especially at the scale that you're talking about, right? Like if it, if it's a little bit more at the SMB or lower mid market scale, I think you can get away with uh, doing some partnerships that last for a couple of years. And then, you know, you find, you found their stuff in a different market and then the company has to prioritize that because they're mm-hmm. trying to get to the next level of growth. But what you do, every decision you, you're taking at your level is, 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 Probably for the next five to ten years, uh, at least, and so, so, so in that type of world, you have to be very careful about uh, the values of the, the organization that you're partnering with, and then what will happen when things go wrong. It's already need to be mapped out in the beginning. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Say, because when exactly. when when things go wrong, it's also at scale. 
you know yes it's not just in like some microcosm right and so so and then you have all your support lines jammed and clogged and uh, and you have all these agents that have to like go and support people it's it's it, it, like these this uh let's call it the the consumption stage of the partnership like needs to be thought through as well and uh, and that's why i think that the opportunity for the modern partner leader is so big and they need a seat at that c suite table is because they're the CEO has to think about production, distribution, consumption as well. So does the partnership leader, because mm-hmm. if you want your company to be relevant in this day and age and you don't have all the resources to keep them relevant, you still need to go and return uh, some uh, uh, provide returns to your shareholders. So you have to look at all three different stages of the uh, of, of a business. And, uh, and I, th- I think that it's a fantastic time to be a, a partner leader. Uh, I can't agree with you more because... Um... It is an exciting field to be in right now, uh, more so than before, um, because the markets change that it changed so fast. Company needs to be more nimble. They need to make sure that they drive the quarterly earnings, but also do it in a sustainable way so that it's not just one quarter only, it's the next quarter, the following quarter, and the following quarter. And partnership has the front row seat in 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 that journey because the ceo the cfo the coo is going to need the role of the partnership leaders to do their part to help drive that bottom line Um, because that's the only way to do it for companies to be competitive one do it at speed uh, and do it in a scalable way because we always want to do growth in exponentially instead of linearly um and if we don't, if, if any companies don't have that recipe to the partner to try to grow exponentially, yeah, you can do it yourself to grow linearly, but you, you're still following your competitor instead of keeping up with leapfrogging them. And everyone's trying to do this. So you, you got to be, the, I think, in a, as a partnership leader role, leadership role, in one way, you got you to gotta break glass uh, in doing your job as well. But doing it in a respectful way, do it for the right reason. Um, because a lot of companies are in business for a while and they say, hey, we never done this before this way with this partner. We don't have a program to support that type of partnership with this partner. Well, just because you haven't done it in the, in the past doesn't mean that you can't do it in the future. Yeah. Um, and um, so you got to be able to take take some pushback and be able to defend your position in terms of why we need to change and why we need to disregard that old program that doesn't work or our business needs change so that program was designed for some other goal but it no longer meets our goal so let's think creatively to try to come up with new programs and don't let we haven't done in the past stop you from doing stuff in the future yeah. i mean it really a solid point and and I'd, i i want to Plus one to your point, because a lot of the conversation, at least in the market, is about where should partnerships sit, right? And to me, uh, even in my own journey, right, like the the role of a CMO is to optimize, prioritize, and optimize markets. To your mm-hmm. point, right, and 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 they will also be breaking glass, right. And then the role of the CRO is to prioritize and optimize revenue. They are also trying new things, and so. You need a person um, who is has a seat at the table who prioritizes and optimizes relationships so that yes. you understand how those programs fit into the other leaders' programs. And then you, again, head back to returning value to shareholders. And so that, to me, is like the bi- biggest business case for a chief partner officer and uh, uh, or equivalent, but like definitely companies sh- and boards should be thinking about um, wh- who comes to those meetings and talks about the priority and, and, and optimization of relationships the same way they look at some of the other metrics. Yeah. And as you're doing that, don't forget who's paying the bill, the customer, right? <laughs> so when, um, uh, when I was at Alibaba, they have a saying that um, our pro- uh, the, the company's pro- priority was Customer first, employee second, shareholder third. If you take care of the customer, okay, take care of your employee. And if your employee is happy and productive, the shareholder is going to benefit. 
But if you flip it the other way around, it might not work as smooth. <laughs> totally. And, and you also had an amazing CEO that drove that, right? Uh, culture through, yeah. through the company. Yeah. So, yeah, like the, the, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's an exciting time to be in this, uh, in this partnership role. And I, throughout my career, I always look at, um, me personally, I always uh, feel that I'm blessed to be able to do what I do, but I earn my street cred along the way to be able to do what I do. But I wake up every day just telling myself, I get to do what I love. Um, life is too short. And to the extent we're lucky enough to do what we love and get paid for it, that's awesome. But the second one, the <laughs> second sorry, one that's is like, awesome. That is the winning yeah. combo. <laughs> and, and the second one is it. it we're here for such short period of time on earth. If you're going to spend your time and effort to be able to do something, make sure you do it at scale and with, with measurable impact. Um, and the third one is do it in rewarding ways. And reward could be, it doesn't have to be monetary. The reward could be just knowing that you're part of an organization or a team or a group that is doing something to help transform and change the way um, the company um are doing business and you know that what you do every day has a material impact and that could be a reward in itself right um and um uh, yeah do what you yeah, love I do with scale of impact and do it in rewarding ways and uh hopefully that will guide your decision in whatever you do uh, in professional world or even uh, personal role as well yeah. yeah, I love that. I think it's a great shout out because I think people sometimes forget people think of like nonprofits and social impact on all that stuff, which totally great stuff. But the reality is technologies change people's lives in fundamental ways, right? Like look how much social media has changed how humans interact with each other, AI. So I think you're right. Like the things we're working on do impact lives and keeping sight of that, which I think goes back to the customer centric framework that you've kind of been putting forth too, but it can also give you meaning in your work as you're enabling people to have better lives. Like that's the goal. Uh, yeah. The meaning part is super important. Everybody's here once I have a purpose in life. And if you can tie that, what you do every day in your work to meet your purpose, then you're lucky. You're, you're the luckiest person in the world. That's why we do this podcast, you know, because we love, we enjoy it so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you so much for walking us through your journey. Thank you so much for encouraging us to think globally, but have a local impact while you're thinking globally. And uh, uh, thank you so much for inspiring us to to continue doing the good work in, in scalable partnerships. And we'd love to have you back on uh, a few months down the road as 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 we get through through. Um, the new things that are coming up uh, this year are just around multi-party partner partnerships and uh, mm -hmm. how to build uh, large-scale coastal programs. I uh, would love to get some advice from you back then. But at least for now, thanks for joining us on the show. No, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Um, like every one of us in this in this industry, right? It's a journey. We all we're we're we're, we're learning as we go, um, and the, the key thing is to keep going on that journey and. Whatever learnings and mistakes you have, I look at that as a blessing because then um, you can you have an opportunity to do something better in the future. And to the extent you can share that with your colleagues and and your partners uh, in building that trust together, that's I think that's a win win recipe for a long term marriage. Super. All right. See you next week, Kelly. Yes. Thank you for listening to Unlearn. Subscribe wherever you listen and visit unlearnpodcast.com for the transcripts.